Hey folks, in this interview, we're gonna be talking about digital storytelling. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. In today's episode, I'm sitting down with uh, a digital storyteller. His name's Benjamin Edwards, and we're gonna find out why he calls himself a digital storyteller and not just just a photographer and for the just to you know to not bury the lead i 100 percent agree with him <laughs> so benjamin Ed- edwards welcome to this week in photo man how are you doing i'm doing great thanks for having me i'm excited to be here yeah this is gonna be good you and i you know we had a we had sort of a pre-interview discussion which we should have recorded in all truth for this because it was it was awesome and super fun yeah right for sure right right yeah. and we we got to talk and and one of the things that uh, that came up was this was this whole idea of digital storytelling versus photography and you know people on this week in photo that have been following us for for any length of time know that from time to time i rant about you know, this sort of this this never ending flow of awesomeness that is photos that we see every day on Instagram, mm-hmm. Facebook, et cetera. But the photos are technically awesome and the concepts are generally good for the most part. But most of the things that that we see seem to be lacking story or which which is how our culture, our cultures sort of thrive right from the beginning of time from caveman days it was storytelling and now for some reason we've lost it even though the tools that we have have gone behind the hammer and and chisel right right, (laughs) and you know and pig's blood on the wall of a cave to i still have some of that in the back i got some too yeah yeah, right (laughs) it's on a shelf somewhere i don't know yeah so so tell me about that tell me about uh, how you made the, the sort of the epiphany of going from, you know, I'm a photographer, I'm, I'm journaling, I'm capturing pixels to, you know what, I'm actually telling stories. How'd that come about? Yeah, uh, and that's a great question. I, uh, I I think for me originally it was uh, every time I introduced myself and, and naturally people would say, well, what do you do for a living? I'm like, well, I'm a photographer. And it was crazy, like almost 100 percent of the time they were a photographer, too, <laughs> or like everyone they knew was a photographer. And like, that's cool. Like, I think we should all like we have the technology now in our phones to, to be documenting life. And um, but I like legit do it for a business like mm-hmm. I support my family, thankfully, for 16 years taking imagery, yep. uh, making imagery. And so after a while, I was like, man, that's, you know, it's kind of weird, and um, and it kind of grated on me a little bit. And then over over time, I think for me, um, I, I've kind of I wouldn't say transitioned, but I've kind of welcomed welcomed in um, uh, additional forms of visual storytelling. So for me, um, it's film, it's video work. Like I yeah. love doing that now, and I've kind of expanded into that. I think for still photographers, that's a natural progression in storytelling right yeah yep. so as a wedding photographer you're trying to tell the story throughout the day with still images um and i love the uh i love the uh, the heightened sense of storytelling with with film and video where you have moving imagery you have uh shots that you can set up you have the addition of music which is highly emotive yes yeah and or so, narration right Anything. or narration right yeah. there's there's so many ways to make it super emotive so i um I kind of consider myself now a storyteller. Like I am all about telling stories for whether it's a bride, whether it's a, an NGO in, a, in, in East Africa trying to get out the message of the work that they're doing, whether it's still or, or video, I'm a storyteller. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I want to talk about that, your, your NGO work, because that's, that's – I mean you're doing – like you talk about storytelling, you're telling important stories. It's one thing to be telling a story of – you know, this is this is how garbage collection works in Silicon Valley, right? right? Versus, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. this yeah. is this is the plight of a whole you know generation of people and and how they're dealing with it. Um, but I want to I want to go back a little bit to the to the storyteller sure. piece of it, and it's interesting that you know because I had some of the same conversations about you know the the, the whole cocktail party thing. Like, what do you do? What do you, what, what's your job? Yeah. It's even harder for me because like it, it's getting easier, but people. A, they didn't understand what the photographer was. B, they didn't understand what the podcaster was. So you're just, you know, <laughs> so, some dude that's yeah. doing stuff. You're like, oh, that's nice. So, hey, Bob, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're kind of left in the corner. Like, right. Oh, uh, right. So yeah, I started right. a couple of years ago, I started talking in terms of multimediographer, right? Oh, yeah. And 
it, yeah. and even that it's just so many syllables it sounds so complicated multimediographer okay it's a multimedia and you record in multimedia but i think your your description just just plain storyteller is clean and it it transcends the mediums right photographer means you're taking photos still photographs videographer means you're you're siloing yourself to video animator this you know voiceover artist that why not just say we, we tell stories so i thank you right. for doing that yeah. i appreciate it yeah and i i, I like that it, it for me it's like it, it either invites a conversation or you know like you just mentioned they say cool and they turn to someone else you know <laughs> like so it's you can you can start a conversation with that um and and it can you know they can get as engaged as they want and yeah. uh for me, also, like I like one of my dreams is to write children's books, and so I I like kind of lump that into the storytelling uh, as well. So it's, yeah, it's a great word. Well, let, let's let's piggyback on that and and talk a little bit about or a lot about the the ethical storytelling that you do. So you mentioned you mentioned that you're involved with NGOs, you know, as a storyteller. So take me through that and how that came about and what exactly you're doing over in Africa. Yeah, so uh, those types of trips just came about through relationships. Um, I was working with some nonprofits, and you know they're kind of all connected in that world. And uh, through various relationships, I was able to go to Estonia and Latvia and do some work. That same organization was going down to do some medical clinics in East Africa, and I'd always had a heart for for uh, that continent. Like Africa is just uh, there's something about it that I there was a draw there, mm -hmm. and um, it was really cool. The the first time I was I was standing in the middle of this medical clinic in, in Uganda, and it was the first time in my life, um, you know, I, I believe that I married the right person, and, and, and there were moments where I was in the right place at the right time. But this was one of the rare moments where I just knew without a doubt that I am standing here doing the work that I was meant to do. There's nowhere else I'm supposed to be right now. And um, it was just a, a gift uh, that just kind of filled my heart. And I was like, man, this is something I want to do more of. And so, uh, again, through relationship, just started doing more and more of those trips. And what, what I found over time was people would, would see blog posts or, uh, you know, uh, pictures on, on Facebook and, and they were photographers or storytellers and yeah. they would say, uh, man, how do you, how do you do this work? Like, how did you get into this? And, and how, how do you do it? And um, a, a great friend of mine, my best friend, uh, Kevin Kubota, who shot my wedding 16 years ago, 17 wow. years ago, wow. uh, was doing similar work. And, and we got together and we're like, man, there, there's like a there's a need for this. Like people want to know how to go out and, and do this work. And and the important thing is to do it right. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we launched uh, w with some other friends, uh, uh, the Nicodems, uh, we launched workshops with purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, WWP exists to help storytellers go into uh, relationships with uh, nonprofits to learn how to navigate those relationships and how to uh, tell stories in an ethical way, meaning that they're uh, leaving dignity intact for, for the people who they're filming or, or um, uh, taking photos of. Mm -hmm. uh, so to go into the community and, and do this in an ethical way so that we're not just taking we're, we're giving um, i love it yeah so so, so you're yeah. so yeah i love I, I love that and that that's uh you know you in in i i, I kind of get the gist of where you're going with that because you're in some cases you could just sort of parachute into an area not parachute but but go into an area <laughs> and then just sort of be the you know you're 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 reaping the natural resources of the imagery that are there Right. Yeah. And, and not giving anything back. You're like, oh, look at all these great pictures. And I, hey, I got my got my compact flash or SD card. I'm out. Right. Boom. And you guys, yeah. rather than doing that, go into a little bit more detail on what you do beyond, you know, aside from just going in and, and taking a bunch of awesome pictures and heading back to Lightroom. What do, what do you what do you guys do that's beyond that part? Uh, for the workshops yeah. or. What, OK, so really it's about. Um, thinking about the country that you're going to doing some research about the country and and the people there and what are the cultural norms what's okay to do what's not okay to do um how you know we want to teach people that you don't just jump out of the guns a blazing like like you were saying oh there's a little kid mm -hmm. and you know don't just get out and start taking a bunch of selfies i think it's we've all seen images where like 
you know, <laughs> a white girl from Kansas goes into uh, Congo and there's a bunch of kids that surround her and she's taking selfies. And right. and right. and we're not thinking about what what the implications of those types of images are, where people look at that and they say, man, there's like no parents around. Like there's just a bunch of orphans running around. And there there are. But um it, there's a sense of cultural sensationalism that yeah. we have when we go visit another place, no matter where that is and no matter where we're starting from. Yeah. And so thinking about what does this image mean that I'm making and yeah. who is it affecting? Uh, if I was a parent and somebody drove by and took photos of my child in that way, how would that make me feel? Yeah. And in reality, in, in the situation that I just described, there's mamas out working in the field. There's dads working around. You know, it's just kids kind of flock to these types of things. So yeah. And how um, how are you so, able to get yourself so as a as a white male going in there into into you know an African community sure. with a camera, you know, with a, or with gear? And I would imagine the gear is probably worth more than they make in a in a long span of time, right? So how how do you go in there? What are the t techniques for you to go in and sort of let them know that it's okay and that you're you're doing the right, right thing and you're not there for exploitive or nefarious reasons. So how do you, how right. do you bridge that gap so that when you take the picture it's ethical? That's a great question and I that's something that that we really teach in our workshops is um it, I believe it's always best to to go into a situation with that like that with somebody who um works for the organization that you're working with so they have connection with the people that mm. you're going to film or document um most of the time the people that we're going to film um, have been helped by this organization in some way. And so they're grateful to be able to tell their story, um, to raise awareness for this organization. But working with somebody on the ground who understands the social um, network of of where you're at, mm -hmm. uh, they understand uh, uh, the implications of, you know, what could go wrong? And and so just really relying on uh, native people who understand where you're at. Yeah. Um, it would be a totally different thing if, if I wasn't working with an organization and I just, you know, you know, Ubered my way out into the Congo or whatever, just took right. a took a took a bus or whatever. It'd be a totally different situation. And not to mention dangerous, uh, right? Because you don't you don't very know dangerous. who yeah. to talk to, who not to talk to. Yeah. You know yeah. this this tribe or or the history, right? This yeah. this this particular group of people may have been they may have had some bad experiences with people that look like you, right? So yeah. you don't yeah. want to go in there without that knowledge and and be made an example of, right? So yeah. Yeah. And as much as you read up on that, I think nothing can replace just having somebody there who lives it every day, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's hugely important. So yeah. that's what we teach is just just asking the great questions, doing the research, and understanding that things can't go wrong. And, and what do you do in that situation? Yeah, yeah, which is smart, which is smart. And I hear that from a lot of uh, workshop runners um, that I have on the show. And that's when they go, especially people that obviously they go to, to foreign – foreign countries outside of their their normal country right so they they even myself we did a, a workshop to vietnam a couple of years ago and there's no way i could have done that <laughs> done that trip without guides right or having yeah, a guide absolutely. yeah you know so the guide is is making sure you're not an idiot and you're going to the right places so that right. you can concentrate on teaching what you need to teach to the to the group of people and making yeah. sure everyone is safe yeah. So tell me about that. You have a so you you have I have in my notes here. You have a story and light workshop coming up in February. Tell me about story and light. What's that? What's that about? So uh, in addition to workshops with purpose, which we've done, um, I think uh, four now. We've done uh, um, gosh, where have we been? Uh, Kenya, uh, Bolivia, Thailand, and we're working on one in in Cuba coming up in April. But um, I'm I'm passionate about doing my own workshops. So story and light came about with uh, just the idea that. Those are two very important things when we're talking about storytelling, right? We've mm -hmm. got to have a story. And uh, especially for still photographers these days, just understanding, I mean, the very definition of photography, you know, when you look at the Greek photos uh, being light, right? Yeah. That's important. Yep. And graphe being uh, drawing or painting. So we have uh, painting with light or, or drawing with light. So my, my belief is that the better you understand light – the better photographer, obviously, you're going to be. So Absolutely. Um, there's a um, there's a lot of natural light photographers who I think 
Um, it's really easy just to say I'm a natural light photographer because then you don't have to learn all the complicated things or mm -hmm. things you feel like are complicated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I really I have a heart for those people like, hey, I can help you. Like, okay, nothing can replace sunset, right? The magic hour is gorgeous. But what if you didn't always have to shoot at sunset? What if you could manufacture light or, or um, modify light in a way that you could be making money all day long, and then at night you get to hang out with your kids? Like, yeah. sign me up for that. Right. So um, Story and Light – yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so Story and Light is really about um, looking for the story, uh, whether it's at a wedding or in a, even a portrait session, looking for the story um, and then creating the best possible image you can. Cool. So yeah, give me, make sure you give me the links and, and all that for that, uh, for, for yeah. folks to sign up for that. We'll make sure they're included Thank in, you. The, in the blog post. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. So one of the things we talked about when we were doing that pre-interview was the, the sort of having a discussion around motivation for shooting, right. And, and sort of getting our brains around that. And that's the, like for photographers or, or storytellers to ask themselves the question, why am I why am I telling a story? Why am I taking this? Is it because I'm trying to shed light on a on a particular thing? Is it just for money? Or am I shooting for likes and followers? Yeah. Right? Which is sort of the new metric. It used to be like back in the print days, right? You'd shoot and you make a print and you'd hang it on the wall and maybe a hundred people would see that print across the life of that print. And you right, were if happy. you're lucky. Yeah. yeah, if you're lucky, or unless you got a gallery show or something. But we were happy. Now that has changed. Now we have the addition of the metrics around it. You know, and like we mentioned in the beginning, the whole deluge of, of good photography that's coming down the line. In your opinion, is it are you like what is it okay to shoot for followers and likes as a motivation for what you're doing, or should you, you know, go a little bit higher? Uh, I, I'd like to think that there was there was a right or wrong answer there, and I, yeah. I, there's just not. I feel like there's it's a why. I think you have to look at why. For me personally, I'm a late adopter of Instagram. Okay, I just had kind of always felt like, you know, I don't have two hours to be on Instagram. Like I gotta go like do my work and go grocery shopping and pick up the kids. Like I don't have right. time to do that. Right. Um, but now I'm at a point where um, I, I really have a heart. Like I want to be teaching and I want to be uh, reaching other people. And um, uh, for whatever reason, like people are on Instagram right now. And yeah. so yeah. you've got to meet people where they're at. And so uh, there's also this mentality that unless you're, you know, 20, 30, 50, hundred K followers, you don't have something to offer. Right. And so I think we as storytellers, we, anybody on Instagram, you feel like you have to, to work on those numbers to get them up so that you, um, people feel like what you have to say is important. Yeah. Um, yeah. now as far as like shooting for likes, um, you know, it's interesting. I feel like there's a lot of photographers, uh, marketing to other photographers mm -hmm. and they're maybe not even selling anything. It's like, I, I, I think about what if, those photographers were actually spending that time uh, marketing to potential clients instead of just trying to impress other photographers to get their likes and their follows. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. um, I think it really depends. Now, in my situation, I am trying to build uh, my my following and, and increase followers just so that um, – because I want to teach. So there's something that I – there's a commodity there for other photographers. So yeah. trying to reach other photographers makes sense. If I'm selling presets or actions or, or workflow or something like that, then I want to have more photographers following me. Yeah. Uh, but there is this definite, I mean, it's so interesting. I, I look at, especially in the Pacific Northwest, um, if, if my wife and I wanted uh, an image or a session where we were hiking up onto uh, a hill and we had the moody clouds in the background and the, the kind of gray Pacific Northwest vibe. If we wanted an image like that, um, I mean, there are, I feel like there are hundreds of thousands of photographers here who are doing that right now. As right? we record this. Yeah. As we record this, they're <laughs> doing that right now. But, but if I want something different, I have to dig a little deeper right now. Yeah. And so I wonder like the one thing that we, as photographers, the, the only thing that people can't take away from us that we can offer clients is ourselves and our own vision. And so when we're shooting just to get likes from other photographers who are doing the same thing, we are limiting ourselves and our potential clients because we're just Absolutely. recreating. We're just copying. We're copying. Yeah. So um, while I try to find the balance of, of creating things that are – I don't want to say trendy, but um, – 
aren't wildly different than what's going on. Yeah. I've well, got to within the zeitgeist yeah, of what you do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I want to put my spin on it. I don't want it to look like everybody else's because there's a hundred thousand people out there who can, who can do those things. Yeah. I want, and, and every time I have a client who, who books me, it's, they always talk about that. Like your stuff is just a little bit different and that's how I know I'm on the right track. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because it's the, you know, I, I do this presentation and there's this course in the TWIP school called the Creative Solopreneur. And one of the areas in that course is we talk about defining your audience. And it goes to exactly what you were talking about, how some photographers get out there and they, you know, they'll start their their social media accounts and the the vernacular and the subject matter that they post is all targeted at other photographers. Like, hey, look at this new Fuji camera I got. Or, hey, look at this new lens. Or, look, hey, I'm now using right. Capture One and not Lightroom and blah, blah, blah. And here's my opinion on the, you know, all that. Exactly. When in reality, your bride is like, Capture who? Light what? <laughs> You know, <laughs> what's a Fuji? You know, I don't care right. about that. I care about should I be hiring you to shoot my wedding, right? Yeah. So, so you know, the, the overall idea is, is that you, you want to be speaking to the people that, you, you know, your target audience. So which begs the question, do you want to, is it better to, to merge the streams and, you know, have one social account where, you know what, yeah, I'm doing workshops, so I kind of want to talk to other photographers because those, those are my customers for that side of my business. But at the same time, I want to be talking to brides. So should you merge the streams or should you segregate and have two separate streams, one that's specifically for your wedding and portraiture clients and then another one that is for peers? What do you, what do you, what do yeah. you think about that? I mean, I think if you have all the time in the day and can <laughs> handle two accounts, like I can barely or an keep assistant. up with one. Or an assistant, right? That's yeah. a, and that's a great idea. If you have employees or an assistant who can who can help with that other account, then probably yes. Uh, for me, I'm in a situation where I try to uh, really leverage stories as much as possible as well. So I have the the images that make the grade for my feed. But I'll go off and show a little personal life in my in my stories. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to potential clients I'll, and I'll talk to to other photographers as well. So I think stories gives us an avenue, especially if we have different categories for highlights, yep. you know, for for brides, for, you know, couples, for photographers. Then we can kind of funnel those stories into those areas and really target. Um, but for me, I, I man, I don't I don't have time. Right. Uh, right. Right. I mean, you're too busy telling stories like you should. Right? Like, yeah. I'm spinning yarn, man. I got to. Yeah. You're Rumpelstiltskin string, you know, spinning, spinning straw into gold. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Well, I, I want to respe be respectful of your time and wrap this up. Um, uh, so what, what else is going on in your world? I know you're so like you, we mentioned and sort of alluded to that you're a wedding and portrait photographer. So I'm sure you're booked up with weddings until you know, the 2020 or so, and then the workshops and all that stuff. So what, what's coming up in the world of Benjamin? Uh, just a lot of commercial projects. I'm super stoked about, uh, again, I, like I mentioned the, the video film stuff, yep. uh, that heightened sense of storytelling. So I love telling, uh, pro, you know, stories for businesses and, and companies. Um, and so, yeah, I've got a few of those lined up and then, you know, it's booking season for weddings and I'm just going to keep push it forward, man. I man. love it. I love it. Yeah. And thank you for, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. This is uh, you know, we, we could talk for hours about storytelling and, you know, Absolutely. the gear necessary and processing and how you lay out a story and all that stuff. But I have a feeling all that's covered in the workshops, right? So where, is, yeah. where should people go to like follow you, you know, if they're a bride, hire you, or if they want to get them on the work, come on a workshop, you know, sign you up bet. for that. Uh, so all that can be at uh, BenjaminEdwardsPhotography.com and uh, Instagram at BenjaminEdwards. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Benjamin Edwards, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank man. you. It was an honor. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. This is Twitter.